Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SAIEE KwaZulu Natal Centre webinar on Seagray Explained and Methods of Operating Lines. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SAIEE YouTube channel, SAIEE TV, under the KZN Centre playlist. You will find the registration link in the chat box. Please register, it's free. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to introduce you to our host this evening. Oh, my apologies. Um, Crystal Anamalai, who is employed by Etiquini Electricity MV and LV Operations as a Chief Engineer and has served the organization for the past 13 years with her involvement in various distribution automation projects and smart grid initiatives. Crystal holds a BSc Electronic Engineering degree from the University of KwaZulu Natal and graduated with a Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Pretoria's Gordon Institute of Business Science. She is registered as a professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa and an active member of Seagray, serving on the Seagray SA Women in Energy Net Zero Initiative work group dealing with climate change impacts on the energy sector. She is also the chairperson of the SAIEE KZN Center. Over to you, Crystal. Thank you, Minx, and a warm welcome to our presenter this afternoon. And good afternoon to all our members and guests that have joined. Today, we will cover an interesting topic on methods of operating lines for various applications. And in addition to this, uh, Dr. Rob, who is our presenter for this afternoon, will further provide an overview of Seagray and the benefits of participating in the various working groups. Dr. Rob Stephen holds a BSc, MSc and an MBA degree and a PhD in overhead line design. Dr. Stephen is currently compiling a Seagray Green Book on compact overhead lines with a co-author from Spain. He is a specialist advisor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and he has where he develops courses on online design, supervises postgraduate students, and advises and assists in research matters. I would now like to hand you over to Dr. Rob Stephen, who will be presenting this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen. <clears throat> you can just indicate if there's any yes, problem on can. screen. You can, thank you. What I'll do today is just do it Seagray explained and line operating. Um, I'm Rob Stephen, as I mentioned, I'm past president, international president of Seagray, uh, and I've been asked today just to give you an overview of Seagray initially, um, as well as then I'll do a talk on line operating. Get to the next. There we go. Okay, so starting off with Seagray, what is the uh, what is Seagray? It's a foremost global community for sharing end-to-end -end power systems. It's an international organisation based in Paris, and it is um, an international organisation. Over ninety countries are, in, are, are, are members of Seagray. Uh, we have national committees. Um, uh, which I will I will explain. So it's an international voluntary organization. Basically, it's a group of experts that get together and they will then uh, solve any problems that you have relating to power generation and delivery. The purpose is for uh, enabling sustainable electricity of all and the mission is to contribute to the betterment of power systems. Um, and it's called a community. It's, it's a global community 
we we sort of felt it's not it's 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 really a group of uh, uh, engineering uh, engineers around the world who are dealing in power delivery, and uh, it's it's to to get everybody there talking and solving problems. So the, this is the vision, of course, uh, authoritative and innovative global community. Uh, the values um, very very important are the values. Um, and you'll find that uh, Seagra is totally apolitical. So you'll find uh, members from Ukraine and Russia, perhaps in the same working group. Um, it's it's really impartial. The big thing we want to do is accessibility, transparency, and so on. Um, the other big thing with Seagra is the integrity. Uh, very very strong on not boosting any particular product or or uh, company and um, ensuring that whatever is stated within the brochures and that is purely uh, um, uh, unbiased. Uh, so um, the, the, the whole thing there is really to indicate that whatever you get from Seagra is a objective engineering uh, opinion. It's not based on any and it hasn't got any sponsorship from any uh, particular uh, environment or company. The other thing we've looked at in the last few years is diversity, equity and inclusion. And there you will have heard that uh, Crystal was part of the Women in Engineering, now it's for Women in Energy. And uh, we've set that up. We've also got a, a next generation network <laughs> um, of young engineers. And uh, the big aim there is to try and get more women and young people into the working groups and structures of Seagrave because we believe uh, the more diversity you have, uh, the better this the end solutions uh, to the problems. These are the strategic themes um, and each of the papers that come in um, would have a look basically at these uh, themes. So we're looking at electricity future and people and skills of the future. So we're looking here really at increasing participation and skills for growing membership. This is really the, as we've got about 10,000 individual and 12,000, 1,200 collective uh, members from 90 countries. Now, collective member is a, um, is a uh, uh, could be a company um, such as Eskom, it could be State Grid. Um, so although they say they've only got 10,000 members, it's actually well over that. Uh, State Grid alone has got about 200,000 engineers. So you can understand that the influence um, of Seagre uh, and selection of working group members is, is really ex uh, extensive. This is a Seagre organization and it's quite, quite complicated, that's why we put this up. You've got the General Assembly, which is the, um, all those uh, national committees join in there with uh, the Secretary General. You then got the Admin Council, um, which has got the president, treasurer, technical committee chairman, past presidents of which I'm a member of that, the IEC president, the secretary general, and that this really does the, you could almost say the general assembly is really your membership at your shareholders, admin councils, almost like your, um, like your board. Um, your steering committee, which we've got there, is all the, <coughs> is, is members from particular countries which then form a steering committee. This is almost like your exec uh, of, of Seagray making uh, strategic decisions, which are then sent to the admin council, which is like a board, which then um, approves the, for example, budgets, fees, strategic directions, strategies, and so on. Then you have the, what's called the technical committee, and this is where you're starting to get the work done. These are all the study committee chairpersons, <laughs> and the study committee is, really a group of, of company of countries uh, that send expert members to a particular uh, committee which is a then a, um, a, a covers a particular topic such as overhead lines cables and so on uh, and and they they then run the strategic technical direction you then get the study committees um, and I'll cover those shortly but really where the main work gets done is here in the working groups where we've got about 230, 250 
active working groups at this point in time. And under those, you get working group convener and working group members. So you get quite a lot of um, topics being dealt with at any one time. And this is all available on the CGRE website. If you're looking at the study, the study committees, um, these cover all the areas relating to uh, power delivery. Um, and we've got, for example, in A, you've got equipment, then you've got systems, which is sort of like insulated cables, overhead lines, substations, HVDC and power electronics and protection and automation. Then you've got the control system, system development, which is your old planning, system planning, system control and operation and system environmental performance, which looks really at all your environmental issues. It's the impact of environmental legislation, etc., on the equipment and systems. Um, so it would be, for example, different uh, environmental laws which come out. How does that affect it? In this as well, we've got, for example, um, studies on uh, electromagnetic fields uh, and things like that. Then we get uh, technical performance, which covers all your quality of supply <coughs> um, type of type of issues. It's a very broad uh, study committee. Then the, another one which was introduced in the early 2000s was electrical markets and regulation. And this is how the um, markets affect the, the grid and the operation of the grid, uh, as well as market design and uh, adaption of the markets. Then we've got uh, distribution systems. Uh, remember, uh, Seagra is not just a transmission company or transmission org focused organization. It deals with end to end. So in other words, it's from the generator right through to the, uh, um, to, to the customer and beyond um, as well. So uh, beyond the meter. So here they're looking at microgrids, um, uh, independent uh, grid systems, PV systems, battery systems, uh, EV, et cetera, and impact of that on the system. So it's, it's, it's quite a wide area here as well. Also dealing with electrification, when we talk about electrification, supplying uh, those in areas without electricity. We've then got materials and emerging. These are looking at your transformer oils, breaker oils, uh, how to replace SF6 gas, and so on. And then information systems, these are all your, uh, um, communica your, your telecommunications, your computer systems, your support of the computer systems, the whole integration of uh, OT and IT, and those kind of things happen here. So in each of these areas, you've got around about 30, 35 experts from around the world, each in a the country. They've had to be selected by the uh, study committee chairperson, and they will then um, uh, become a member of the study committee. And South Africa has a member in in all of the uh, in all of the study committees um, and uh, there's uh, in each of the countries you will have what's called a regional activity group and um, if you're interested you can actually get all the information from what's happening around the world in each of these areas by joining the regional activity group which is chaired by the study committee chairperson if you've got a problem in your area, uh, you can raise that with the study committee chairperson. They raise it at the study committee in international study committee meetings. And if there is an enough interest, they then form a working group based on that problem that you want to solve. Uh, you then get groups, uh, working group uh, members from around the world, experts from around the world, and they sit together and solve your particular problem. And uh, what's very interesting is that you'll find that the, um, the members of the work groups are normally uh, world experts in the, in the area. So you, you will actually get the, 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 the actual end product is something which is um, quite uh, extensive. In my case, when I did my master's on thermal rating of lines, I attended the working group and in the working group was all the people I referenced uh, in my thesis, so it was quite daunting, but I found that uh, the people there were actually very open, these experts, and uh, you could actually discuss every little aspect uh, with them. 
Um, and it was very interesting to see the uh, interaction between the experts when they disagree on something as to as to how deep they go into the theory. So that's what you have within the working groups. <clears throat> so the local organization, as I mentioned, is you have a national committee, South Africa, you've got 60 national committees around the world, uh, you've got the SC members, and you have regional activity groups, which consist of industry, utilities, and academia, and you get feedback from the CGRA work group and the study committee, and you can give CGRA, as we mentioned, to suggest new work. So how does it work? Well, CGRA has conferences, you might have heard this. We have conferences in South Africa normally every two years. Uh, colloquia, where you have the study committees coming out and they actually discuss, they have papers on their particular topic. Symposia, which is very similar to conferences, but it's, it's, uh, the, 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 it's arranged by the central office in Paris and uh, the referees for the papers are the study committee uh, experts, not the local experts. Then you have tutorials, which we present all over the world. And of course, every uh, biannual, every two years, this year as well, you will have the Paris session where all the study committees meet. And uh, we have around over 3,500 participants. And we're hoping to get up to over 1,000 papers, uh, which are actually discussed at this Paris session. They're not presented, um, which gives you, you've got to read the paper before you go there which is quite interesting. Um, then you have international work bodies dedicated to topics of common interest and then publications. So these are really how the work groups work from, we've got 230 works on international work groups and you get technical brochures, which then give you to, your knowledge out of it. And these are the publications. And this is really the, the, the websites where you can go. Uh, this is a Seagrave Science and Engineering website where you can see how to publish papers in Seagrave Science and Engineering. Uh, you can send me an email, I'm the uh, Editor-in-Chief for Seagrave Science and Engineering. So we have a Power Talk, which is information on development. These are all free download. Uh, leadership Circle, articles aimed at CEOs, just to tell them a, just brief what's happening in the world of, of power delivery, future connections. These are on technical articles on technical trends. For example, hydrogen. Um, and introduction of hydrogen onto vehicles and things like that. That's one of the type of topics you'll get. Then Electra, uh, you'll get um, working, some of the working group summaries, and you'll get uh, interest, uh, interested articles coming out a little bit longer than what you'd have, longer articles you'd have in future connections. Now the main output of CGRA is the technical brochures, um, and uh, these are the outputs of the particular working group. So you'll, you'll find that a number of these brochures actually form the basis for IEC standards, such as um, how to calculate uh, SAG tension in, in, in uh, conductors, for example, uh, became an IEC standard. Then you get green books, which, um, for example, with the technical brochure, we had technical brochure on compact AC and compact DC lines. And um, we then combined that, and I'm pleased to say that the Green Book on Compact Lines is now published, um, which I worked on with a, a, a colleague of mine from Spain. And then you get the Seagrave Science and Engineering, which is Scopus registered for all the academics out there. The technical ref referee papers um, is, is really, we, the, the, the review process is extremely stringent because what happens is the when we do get a paper in, we send it to the study committee chairperson. So if the paper's on overhead lines, we send it to the study committee chair. They then select the particular experts around the world to review the papers. There's three reviews per paper. So it's not from one country. You could get a reviewer from Canada, Brazil, and perhaps a, a, um, in Europe somewhere uh, that are experts in that particular field. Uh, they review the paper uh, and um, give comments back to the authors who then have to revise the paper and if accepted, it's published. So we get quite a lot of rejections. Almost all the papers have to have some form of revision. But once it is published, uh, you can be assured that that paper will stand, um, that that paper will stand any, any uh, scrutiny from around the world. The other big thing is that CSE is free to publish 
and it's a free download. So you, you don't have to pay to publish your papers and it's free download. So you get a maximum uh, exposure of your work um, uh, when you publish in Seagrass Science Engineering. So this is really how they, um, this is an example of a green book. You get the all this all these documents become go through to the IEC work bodies. Uh, you can have direct publication into IEC, or it's used as dialogue between manufacturers and information for the electricity power sector. And then we use the, quite a few of the books are used for education. So how do you get most out of Seagray? Working groups, networking is your main area. If you want to get anything out of Seagray, your best training area is to join a working group. Um, and you can do that through the regional activity groups and so on. Um, you go through the local study committee member. They then suggest that to the chairperson. If, the, if your CV uh, is acceptable, you can then become a member of the work group as long as you contribute. And the big thing is that you need to contribute to, to, to uh, if you can, volunteer to positions in the work group, give contributions in the working group, and for example, if they need a working group secretary, I would say volunteer for that because you really have to learn the topic to be able to write minutes of what they're saying. So this is really how you would do it. Contribute to all activities, uh, chapters in, in, in documents or papers, uh, conference papers, etc., and then submit paper to CSEs and conferences, etc. But the, re the big thing is get involved at the lower level with the work groups. Uh, that's where you'll meet the experts in your area, and it's the best training ground that you'll ever experience. So what will you gain? A global network of experts. Basically, if you have a study committee meeting, uh, the members in that study committee will be able to solve almost any problem you have in your particular area. So if you've got a problem on, 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 on foundation slip on certain soils, you can be certain that somebody in that in that meeting uh, has had that problem or is busy solving that problem and can help you with that problem. If they haven't solved it, you can form a work group to solve the problem. The other big thing is that you'll know these experts personally, which is a big thing. Um, in my case, we had we were trying from Aberdeer Cables, actually trying to get a, a list of types of alloys that they had um, from for, for high temperature al aluminium and they were battling for for quite a while because it's not really all that published. I knew somebody uh, in Japan who was uh, for, uh, working on that particular topic and within a day we had all the information they needed. So this is really where you can help and get a lot of information. Yeah, you've got direct access as well to thousands of Seagrave uh, published about 10,000 documents, got documents, papers, um, everything which is all available on the Seagrave website. You just got to register. Um, and uh, if you're not a member, you have to pay uh, for papers and, and brochures. But if you are a member, uh, it's free download. Um, feedback on your suggestions. You get, you get. Um, if you are making suggestions within the work groups, uh, you will get some uh, very good suggestions coming back uh, or, or, or opinions that you can bounce off. Uh, and uh, some good and some bad, but they're all valuable. Uh, you get feedback from reviewers on papers submitted. And as I say, the, the review of the papers is extremely strict. So you will get comments that this equation is no longer valid or you haven't explained this correctly or um, you need to use the latest details or so on. So, um, it, but it really will, the, the reviewer findings really enhance the papers. And you get, uh, I've had the best career growth and development from uh, getting involved from uh, Seagrave papers and you don't see gray work and you don't get that from papers. Um, the working group is normally working two years ahead of where your publishers are. So if you want the latest of your particular topic, get involved in a work group because they are dealing with the theory um, sort of two years ahead of where you, you will get it off the IEEE uh, uh, or other um, published papers. So that's really Seagray. Um, I'll now get to, to, to uprating of overhead lines and hopefully it, I'll, I'll go through it fairly rapidly so that we have some time for questions. I've got two case studies at the end and um, hopefully we can, um, we can get some good questions. 
So at, um, when you're looking at uprating of lines, I'm looking really here at your thermal rating, although there is also a voltage upgrade and AC to DC conversion. Um, but we, why did you need to increase the thermal rating? Normally high load growth, limited capital, pressure to increase the transfer capacity, and your in your in 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 lines, of course, you've got different uh, power transfer limitations, voltage stability, and thermal. We're talking more here about thermal. Where does thermal apply? Normally, on your first this is length of line. This is an example of a three to four hundred kV line. And there you're looking at around, say, if the thermal rating is about 800 MVA, you can do that for maybe 100 kilometers. Above that, now you start getting limited by other effects. Um, voltage drop or stability concerns and so on. And then over your power flow is limited to about 25% thermal rating for a 1,000 K line. On AC, you almost never get that kind of length. But it's just to give you an idea here, that the thermal rating is something which affects the first part of the line. Unless you can compensate your lines, uh, then you remove the stability issue and you can increase the thermal, uh, the range of the thermal limit. Because the nice thing about thermal limits, you can increase them without too much cost, which we'll cover. So the thermal limits of lines are a function of conductor temperature, which is basically a function of the safety to the public. If it sags, below the OSH Act um, or your particular regu regulation in your country uh, level, then it, it would be a uh, in, in breach of the, of the particular act and that affects safety to the public. Now, the thermal rating is that current which will result in the regulatory height being reached um, and it's exposed to thermal conditions. So your thermal rating, people don't often realize, but it changes all the time. Because if you've got a wind blowing, you can push more power down the line to get the same temperature. Uh, if it's raining, you'll be able to push a lot more down for the same temperature. So it's, it's continually changing. And this is really where we can use certain devices for uprating and so on. Uh, the methods to determine thermal rating, well, I won't get into it too much, but most people use a deterministic. We assume certain ambient conditions which you then calculate the current that will result in certain temperature with those particular conditions. The problem with deterministic is that you are selecting certain ambient conditions, but you've got no idea of the risk uh, in that particular area. So there's a Seagrave brochure 299, um, which goes right through the whole, uh, how to determine these ambient conditions. And this is now in our current South African regulations. The next one is a probabilistic, where you would use a risk of exceeding a temperature, temperature or design temperature, and you'll, you'll determine a risk of exposure to the public. It uses actual weather data, not assumed, um, and then you generate a whole lot of uh, risks, etc., using the exceedance um, for that particular area. The other ways is uh, real-time monitoring. Um, once you've determined the particular uh, temperature, this actually measures the sag or temperature of the particular line and then tells you what your current can be in the next little period. So methods to remove your constraints, you can use a deterministic method. And the, 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 one of the big things here is that don't recalculate. What happened in the US was that they uh, decided to increase the um, wind speed that they had used before from one foot per second to two feet per second without doing a risk calculation. That caused one of the big blackouts in the Northeast uh, in the early 2000s. Um, so do not recalculate. If you do use deterministic method, um, you increase the temperature, temperature and then you re-rate the line based on that. For probabilistic methods, we say use with care. Uh, you can, um, there are two methods you can use, one to increase risk and the other to retain the existing risk, which I'll cover. And to increase the risk, you need to be used with care. You really don't increase the risk without knowing exactly what you're dealing with. To retain the same risk, you can use your local weather data and a local profile. And this is really what we, what we prefer to do. In other words, if you determine your risk in Johannesburg uh, is, is, is a certain level and you then go to a area in Cape Town where the weather um, is uh, 
a lot cooler, uh, you can keep the same risk, but increase your current. So this is using um, a percentage exceedance using different load profiles uh, with, the, with the risk. If you've got a flat uh, load profile, uh, this is the, the risk that you will have of exceeding. If you have different load profiles, uh, in other words, you have a very peaky load profile, your actual risk of reaching that particular temperature is then a lot lower. You can understand if, you, if you're if you hitting 400 amps once uh, in 12 months compared to having 400 amps continuously, your risk of reaching a certain temperature is a lot lower, and this is what has been shown here. So the limits to probabilistic rating <laughs> that we need to take into account is that if you are doing this kind of calculation, you might get about a 20 degree above your design temperature in some cases. Note that if you're using a deterministic rating, you have no idea what that is. It could even be higher. So what we're saying as well is you, you, you've got to have at least a 10 minute interval of weather data so you know exactly what's happening to your conductor in that area. And if you, if you don't have that, don't go above 80 degrees C. In South Africa, we don't temperate above 80 uh, because you might start having annealing or SAG issues. Uh, overseas, they temperate up to 120, 130 degrees. Um, but then you've got to be really careful as to, as to how, what your actual conductor temperature is going to be. Because if it's 120, you'd be sure that you will have annealing. And if you have annealing, your SAG uh, will be higher than what you originally thought of with your final SAG uh, uh, profile. In real-time monitoring, what the real-time monitoring does really is it um, is that it 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 measures the SAG in real time and the temperature in real time. So your risk is not increased, and your temp your conductor does not operate above the design temperature. If your design temperature is 50 degrees C, it will operate at it'll keep your it'll it will inform you as to what your um, current could be in the next hour, 10 minutes and so uh, for that design temperature. In other words, what current will give you 50 degrees C now? It's at night and it's raining. Well, you can maybe push a lot more down that line to get 50 degrees C. So that it won't allow you to operate above that particular design temperature. When you have increases above probabilistic ratings, you can be 10% to 30% above using real-time monitoring. In other words, from your probabilistic ratings, um, you will you will see that the uh, that you've calculated say 370 amps uh, for a Wolf conductor. Uh, what you might find with your real-time monitoring is that you can go um, between 10 and 30% above that. The problem is as well is that if you've got lines that are temperatured quite low, like 50 degrees C, you might find at some point it says you can't push any current down because the solar and uh, uh, rating with no wind at this point in time, it pushes your uh, conductor temperature close to 50 degrees C. So really where you get the benefit of this is above 100 degrees C, because then you can, then you can really see you've got a lot of SAG uh, that you can actually, um, ensure that you can have really high currents flowing. Remember, above 80 degrees C, your solar doesn't play much of a role in your conductor temperature. And uh, also with real time, don't measure at one point, you need to measure this, the section that you are looking at or the whole line. This is looking at how to increase your design temperature. For example, if you go from um, a wolf conductor at 70 degrees C, will give you the same rating as bare conductor, which is a 250 compared to 100, uh, a 150 compared to a 250 mole squared. We can go from um, normal rating of 548 to 549. In other words, if you're running out of, you, you, you've got a wolf conductor in at 50 degrees C, uh, instead of changing that conductor to bare, uh, you can increase the tension or increase the height and get 548 amps at 70 degrees C, which will give you uh, a higher rating than B at 50. So you don't have to change the conductor. This is really what we're saying here. So you, you increase your ground clearance. And how do you do that? You increase your tension, but you have to be careful, careful of vibration. Or you could change the insulator configuration from, a, from an I to a, 
to an inverted V um, to give you a particular height above ground. Um, the next option that you can use is a reconductoring, which is um, which is a lot more expensive, but it gives you a lot more uh, uh, um, current carrying capacity. And you can see that here, uh, where you've got a normal ACSR and a, and a, a TAC, which is a thermal resistant ACSR. Um, and you can go uh, from 645 to 1030, for example. And you can even go higher now with the other kinds of conductors. Just to give an example of replacing conductors, if you've got, you started off here with conductor A, um, and it's rated sort of at, at, at you want to do it around about, a, you want to look at an ampere rating of about 1,000 amps, um, you could use uh, conductor A at, at sort of 60 degrees uh, temperature, um, or you could use conductor B at, with as a 400 square mole at 100 degrees C, or you could use a high temperature conductor 200 moles at 200 degrees C to give you the same rating. Uh, obviously, your losses are going to be a lot higher with this conductor, the 200 rather than the 800. And that's where you need to look at your full, um, your load profile and the loading of the particular line. Now, these are the kind of conductors that I was mentioning. This is mentioned in the number of the uh, C-grade brochures. Um, and basically, what we normally use is ACSR, so most common. You then get a thermal resistant ACSR, which is steel reinforced. You can then get a thermal resistant AC, uh, aluminium alloy, which is INVAR reinforced. INVAR means invariable. Uh, and it's, it's really a, a it's certain alloy of steel, which doesn't vary much with temperature. You can then get a high strength thermal resistant aluminium alloy steel reinforced. Then you can also get what's called this gap conductor, um, which is shown here in, the, in, the, in, in, in this diagram. And what it has is it's got a gap between the core and the particular uh, uh, aluminium. And you can either use a TEL or a Z-TEL or whatever. You can have a round shape and a trapezoidal. There's a number of options. And this will give you the reason they use a gap is because of the low knee point, which I'll cover. Um, then you could use uh, ultra thermal resistant aluminium alloy steel reinforced, ultra thermal resistant alloy with invar reinforced, extra thermal resistant. These go up to higher temperature, 250 degrees C. Another one which is very common is the ACSS, uh, which is not a high temperature low sag, it's a high temperature conductor. And it's an aluminium conductor which is fully annealed. Uh, so it only depends on the steel core to carry the load. Then you, you get what's, what's called here the, and these are the different types according to IEC. Um, your type three is a thermal resistant aluminium alloy with a metal matrix core, uh, developed originally by 3M. Um, but this has got a, 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 a particular core, which is a metal matrix, which doesn't sag. So that's a high temperature, low sag. Then what's become very common uh, over the last, uh, well, not really common, but um, in a lot of development uh, is, is the uh, polymer matrix complex here, which is a thermal resistant aluminium conductor polymer matrix composite core reinforced. So in other words, it's a, um, you can either get a, a, a composite core or polymer reinforced. And on the right here, we can see what's a single, um, a single uh, uh, cord uh, conductor normally made by, uh, it's called the ACCC conductor, and it has a single carbon core uh, as a, um, as a strength component. Now that doesn't sag at all, and it's got a very low knee point, which is very good. This one above here is the, um, above that is the 3M, and this is the INVAR cores. So these are the kind of conductors that you can use. Now, when do you want to use them? Well, if you're looking at a particular um, uh, situation where you've got a certain sag, and you've got the uh, turn ACSR conductor, and that up to 100 degrees C will give you the sag. That's it. You cannot go more than 100 degrees C on this conductor. So now you want to increase this um, to, to, to get more 
uh, power down the line. And so therefore you have to have a higher temperature. So you could try say the A triple AC SS trap wire, which will take you up to about 120 degrees, 130 degrees C. So now instead of only pushing down current, which will give you 100, you can now go to 130. Uh, or you could do the ZTAC uh, INVAR core. Now you can see that there's your INVAR invariable core. Um, and it does not then sag very much more once it hits that knee point. The knee point is a point at which the, uh, all the, um, the, the uh, weight or the load goes onto the core. And you want that done as soon as you can. As lower is better so that you can get a higher temperature before hitting your sag limit. The next one you could do is the, um, is the ZT uh, ACCR, which is your uh, composite matrix uh, core. And there again, you can see depending on where the knee point. Knee point depends on, on the loading and on the ruling span. So it's not, a, it's not every, you can't just say this is the knee point for all of the applications, it's not. The next one is the ACCC. And the nice thing about this ACCC is you can see as soon as it hits that carbon, carbon core, it's virtually horizontal. It's better than any of the metals. Uh, and this is why it's quite popular. Um, the next one is your gapped. And you can see the gap has no knee point. So it depends purely on the metal um, as, as to how that, that goes forward. Now the, the ACCC has stopped here at around about 180. A uh, number of the polymers have, a, have an issue uh, of changing the core uh, composite uh, above a certain temperature. So you can't run that normally to 150, 250, whereas you see the others can go a bit higher. So depending on what you want, if you need to go above 200 degrees C, you might need to use some other kind of conductors. And depending how much uh, uh, sag you can tolerate, you might wish to use, if your sag was, for example, down here at 12 meters, uh, or, or at here at, at say 11 and a half for a 50 degree C and you wanted to increase it well you could only really increase it uh, the, the rating if you start using the ACCR or the GAP or the ACCC. So this is really where you need to look at so not all uh, high temperature low SAGs are suitable for all applications. Now what do you need to consider before operating? What's your load and load profile? Uh, what's your present position of the conductor? You need to fly the line because normally what you find is that your line's under clearance anyway and you didn't know about it. Um, and you need to actually determine the present profile and design temperature. You might also find that you've got extra buffer uh, because the surveyors at the time allowed a certain buffer for uncertainties. Uh, so you might actually find that is a situation. You then need to look at the condition of the conductor if you're not going to change the conductor. Uh, nicks or gunshot damage, uh, corrosion or bird caging, and then you look, need to look at the, the joints, um, and you need to actually look at the joints for infrared or for resistance measurements, and then also your terminal equipment. No point putting in a, a allowing higher load if your if your line traps can't take the load. This is really the best method to use and when, and this has been published. Um, Deterministic, you can use when it's below 80 degrees C, your cost is medium. That's when you increase your tensions. Probabilistic, you increase your temperature, temperature. You can make use of load profiles, weather data, and then you can change, you can keep your risks the same. Uh, it's good for temperature temperatures below that and peaky low profiles. Real-time monitoring, you can install a system. It's more at higher, a higher temperature temperatures. And it's networks where trading of power is undertaken, it becomes very useful. There's a lot of this going on at present in the US. Then reconductoring, replace existing conductor with a new conductor. Uh, normally you need, um, you need to replace it with a conductor with the same uh, outer diameter um, so that your wind load and uh, mechanical loads on the towers are not affected so you don't have to change your towers. This is just a case study. Uh, that we used um, a few years back. It was a 66 kV hair conductor uh, and oak. Uh, we needed to increase the capacity for six months. The nine needed to be utilized, emergency limit for 20% of the time. 
and the increase required was from 292 to 390 amps uh, just for this particular period. So we used the absolute probability levels, that's 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the 4. We use a corresponding e exceedance level for flat load profile, and we then determined the ampacity from keeping the exceedance level constant with the actual load profile and weather conditions. So we didn't increase the risk at all. Uh, we used the weather conditions from the Western Cape, and we assumed a conservative flat load profile. And this is a graph I've indicated before, so we used the flat load profile exceedance curves. And we managed then to increase the, um, the load, the, the, the rating as was required. And after six months, the rating then was reduced to the existing one. And this was in winter, so your risks were very low. Inspections were done on the line. Um, and we had only one incident of a jumper joint. And you might ask, why is a jumper joint fail? Well, that's a joint which has no tension in the joint. So if it's not installed correctly, uh, you'll find always your jumper joints fail. Um, because the, the, the mid-span joints, if they're not installed correctly, normally fail mechanically. There was no other incident. The line achieved 400 amps on four or five occasions. So this is very, it's a very small amount of time. There was no load shed. Uh, and then the load was successfully deloaded after six months because we had strengthening of the system. So the investigation that we managed to do here without really doing much on the line at all, besides inspecting it and making sure the clearances were okay, was that we saved many hours of interruption in a very volatile area, supplying areas uh, in, in townships in the Western Cape. Just another case study. Um, they needed strengthening. They investigated increasing the thermal limit to delay the uprating. And we used a modified exceedance method. And we used the risk of unsafe condition arising to be kept constant. And this is the risks that we determined uh, when we uh, determined the probabilistic ratings. And you can see the risks are coming out at around 10 to the minus 6, which is the same as the um, Kuberg uh, nuclear uh, power station. So the risk here of having any unsafe condition arising um, where it might affect the safety to the public due to uh, um, your load, your, your, your current going above or your conductor increasing temperature is extremely low. And that's why this method has been accepted um, in our regulations. So we used a flat load profile from Bloemfontein, which was a hot conservative area. And then we used the ratings for the Cape area using actual weather data which indicated that these are the following increases that were actually possible using this method. But you needed to check, sorry, you needed to check that the um, actual temperature, needed to check the actual temperature to be reached. So what we did was, because you could push so much power down, we had a look at, well, if we, if we push a certain current down, what is the actual, um, uh, chance of exceeding, how many hours will we actually exceed a particular temperature? Because you don't want to anneal the, the conductor. Um, and you found there that, that this was more or less what we had. If we pushed over 800 amps or 830 amps, we might have one hour uh, exceeding the particular, that, that, that particular temperature. So that the risk of annealing, because annealing is cumulative. So if you um, exceed 90 to 100 degrees C this year and you do one hour next year, you've got two hours. Um, so it's cumulative. But there are big sum arguments. There are C grade documents published on annealing. Um, and you'll find that the um, that that normally they argue whether it's above 80 degrees C or 100 degrees C. Normally you, there's all agreement that you will get annealing over 100. Uh, but they're saying that over 90, you can get some annealing, but it's actually not that critical. The other important thing to look at was uh, the effect of solar radiation and wind speed. And um, the important thing to look at here, yeah, I'll just put this in as an example. 
this is your temperature with a particular load and the difference between day and night at this high current is almost negligible and uh, the big effect is really wind speed so if you are running around about three amps per millimeter squared and above uh, for your conductor um, the big thing that's going to increase your temperature of the conductor is going to be wind speed it's not going to be solar uh, so the, um, the, the this is often a misconception uh, when uh, they say well we, we've got a really hot sun here and this is a problem it is an issue on lower temperating temperatures but uh, the effect of wind speed is in fact a, a far more so you'll find that um, with the higher temperating temperatures of 80 and, and so on, that your higher temperatures occur at night, where there's no wind speed at high load. Um, it doesn't occur in the day where you've normally got turbulence with a high solar radiation. So it's just something to bear in mind that your wind speed effect is really important. And as we said, if you go from, uh, well, this is meters per second, but if you go, you can drop your temperature from about 70 degrees down to about 40 degrees, just with one meter per second increase, which is which is really large. So the, in conclusion, there are different methods of probabilistic rating determination. The absolute method, which determines your 10 to the minus six, et cetera, can be used as a basis for the exceedance method. Exceedance is how is is how much percentage of the time will your um, is is your temperature, your design temperature likely to be exceeded? And you might say, well, it should be zero. And that's why we use a deterministic method. Well, when you use a deterministic method, you've got no idea what it is. Um, and in the past, what we've done, we found that the uh, that that the um, because we had no uh, uh, incidents um, of public of public safety, we used the deterministic uh, ratings that were done before and determined what the exceedance and absolute probability of an unsafe condition arising was, and then we increased the temperating temperature and to develop new ratings based on that. And that's now included in the in the OSH Act. So the use of load profiles is a big impact on thermal rating, but you've got to be very careful. As we said, one or two, one or two hours in a six months, that, that's acceptable. You must be very careful with application. And what we've done in some other ratings uh, examples was that we specified that if the wind speed dropped below one meter per second that they need to get somebody to send out to the particular um, uh, span just to check that is that, that, that the actual uh, conductor was uh, at the clearance that was required so that it so that we really don't take chances um, in just in just pushing the power down the line so the recommendations that we did for this one was that the line be rated at 529, which was a standard normal rating, and we increased the, the contingency rating. Uh, at that time, the, the, we could move the strengthening out by eight years. It was only applicable to that line. All joints had to be tested by a resistance method. Um, and any joint, you'll see there's a super great document on uh, resistance measurements of joints. And you'll find that if they are, if the joint is at the same or higher resistance than the conductor, you must replace it. Even if it's the same, it must be less. And uh, you'll see there in the in the Seagro document it says how much less and how do you actually determine the you measure resistance on the conductor and your resistance across the joint. And the joint must be a certain percentage less than the conductor, otherwise it must be replaced. Um, if it's not replaced, what you can do is put a, a wrap around the joint so that if it does actually fail, it will not drop the conductor. So, as we've mentioned here, a wrap tie is placed around to prevent it failure. Joints need to be checked regularly, and oint joints the same or hotter temperature need to be replaced, especially on your jumpers, uh, where you could get a, um, a, a fail. So the real time. We said we could use real-time monitoring systems. Over eight wasn't necessary at the time. And uh, Chair, that's the end. I'll, I'm quite willing to take any any questions. We think we've got a bit of time uh, for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Rob Stephen. I think that was quite informative. 
Uh, I'd like to welcome questions uh, from our attendees. You can just pop it into the chat and we're more than welcome to uh, cover some of your concerns. Um, Dr. Rob, yes, thank you for your commitment and thank you for sharing your valuable insights. Um, I think maybe while we're waiting for some questions, you can tell us maybe more about your involvement um, with the Green Book. Does it cover some of the case studies that you've uh, gone through today? Uh, no, the, the, what I've covered today is covered in um, uh, it's it's covered in in Seagray, uh actually the Electra magazine um, on probabilistic rating um, and also uh, all the theory on how to calculate conductor temperature is covered in technical brochure 601, which I was I was involved in, and it's also all covered in the um, Green Book on overhead lines, the Seagray Green Book on overhead lines. And what I didn't mention, there are two things I didn't mention. The one was that the the Seagray, the, the books themselves are very expensive if you buy the whole book, but you can actually download a chapter, specific chapter of, of the of the book uh, if you wish to um, uh, just be interested in a particular topic. The other The other important thing for those academics out there, students, if you are in more than 50% of your time, either postgrad or undergrad, uh, you can join CGRAY through the National Committee uh, for free. Uh, and you can get access to all the documents for free for a period of up to eight years, as long as you are still studying. Um, so that, that could be something really useful, especially for postgrad uh, students as well. All the, not the green books, but the brochures, papers, um everything else is 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 then downloadable or accessible for free okay perfect thank you dr rob i think um to continue we can um hand over to uh, minx um i think there's also some handouts that uh, can be accessed um on your right from your control panel um there are two handouts from our acad academic brochure from, from our corporate uh, head office and our June edition of the What Now. So I think those are two handouts that are available. You're welcome to download it. And to those that have attended, um, yeah, I think it's, it's great to be involved with Seagray and you can see the benefits of joining and the content that's shared. Uh, and the valuable insights. And once again, thank you, Dr. Rob Stephen, and um, thank you to those attendees that have, um, I hope it was insightful and you've gained some uh, knowledge. And I'd like to hand over to Minx. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, you might have missed, we've got a few questions in our questions panel. Um, Dr. Stephen, um, our first question from the Bochum Tombela is asking does these conditions of uprating differ for monopoles and lattice slash double circuit structures or is it all the same for 132 kv regardless of the structure type um no uh, thermal uh, rating is purely conductor and sag so it's independent of the tower type it can be lattice pole or whatever obviously on double circuits it's only the lower uh two uh uh uh, uh phases that, that that are of concern the rest are of course above that so you don't worry about those relating to uh, sag but you have to keep the thermal rating of the other two circuits above the lower circuit at the same rating so that your one your top obviously doesn't sag into the other one um but uh, so, so in other words uh, if you've got different lines uh, multi-circuit uh towers uh with different uh uh, the, the, the conductors above your bottom tower might be a different line where you'd get different loadings. You've got to be certain that you keep the same uh, rating so that you don't get um, variable sag between the, 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 the phases. But uh, normally that's a very rare case. So you would then just look at the uh, particular conductor and then the rating of that conductor either determine probabilistic or deterministic using uh, C-grade brochure 299. Uh, to determine the uh, the rating of that particular conductor, so it's it's uh, it's 
it's um, independent of this of the structure type. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Uh, Crystal, do you want to take over the questions or shall I just continue? Uh, sure, it's fine. Yeah, we can go through. I think there's a few more that's come in now. Um, yes. Okay, maybe we could go with um, Lucy Sanguini, uh, Dr. Rob. Um, he has asked, uh, how long can one run a power line under emergency capacity of a conductor? Um, the the it, it depends on the utility. Basically, what we've done, uh, if you're talking Eskom, um, which are directly involved with, uh, the uh, there's a contingency rating, and that contingency rating, uh, you get a normal rating and a contingency rating and an emergency rating, it's three ratings. Um, the normal rating is the ones that you would determine through your probabilistic, et cetera, et cetera. Your contingency, is if one of those line circuits are out, for example, you've got two lines supplying a load. Um, if one line is taken out of service, you can use the contingency rating. Uh, and that can go actually uh, on for 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 indefinite period of time, uh, as long as care is taken, uh, relating to, you know, you've, you've checked the line, it's integrity, you haven't got chips on your conductor and all that kind of stuff. You can then run it. For example, if you're refurbishing one line, you can run the other at contingency rating uh, for a period of a month or until the till the refurbishment's done. The emergency rating is a rating where you've really got stability problems on the network. You need to run a conductor for a really high period of time, really high rating, but for a very short period, in other words, 20 minutes. Um, we've then got a, a, a an emergency rating. And to my knowledge, that's never been really used. Um, but there were methods to determine the emergency rating so that the risk was not increased. Um, so there's three ratings, so normal, uh, the contingency where one lines out, and then your emergency rating. So those are the, those are the three ratings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rob. We've got a few more. Um, there's another by Naniki and Zuza. Could you share a bit more on dynamic line rating and its application for increased power transfer on lines, its applicability to the South African grid? I'm not sure if you've covered that. Man. Sure. Um, <clears throat> look, the, the real-time ratings were studied on the SA grid uh, around about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, it has applications, as I said, where you've got fairly high temperature temperatures, around about 80, which most of our lines are now done at around 80. Um, and basically what it does is you could use the different methods. A lot of them are now using um, a, a, a laser detection of the, of the panel, uh, of the conductor, so that, that, that it would measure your conductor sag in real time uh, without actually attaching anything to the conductors. It's, and they've then got methods to determine from that particular point uh, where the rest of the uh, uh, sags in the particular line section would be. Um, other methods are using um, uh, load cells where they put into the strain assemblies and then uh, the, they measure the sag in that particular section and uh, they, you can then determine uh, using uh, a wind, you have to have a weather station as well, as to what the um, rating can be in the next 20 or 30 minutes. The, uh, the big thing that we found was that you need to integrate this into your SCADA system and bring it into the operator's um, panels so that they can see what is there, what's not there, what they can do. And what we found was, um, and it might change, um, especially when you go into the markets, uh, that the that the operators were saying, look, it's too much information. Yeah, when the system's collapsing, we don't want to know what the thermal thing is. We're just going to operate these these lines. Um, but if you've got trading and uh, you, you you're running sort of at a at a thousand dollars a megawatt, every little megawatt you get down the line, you'll get another thousand dollars. 
then they're very keen on looking at what kind of um, loading they have or what kind of capacity is available on that line. Um, so the application um, may actually be, depending on, on, on the market, uh, we're going into new structures, et cetera, within transmission, whether that might be um, possible or not, or if you've got, if you've got uh, IPPs, which have got really strong, um, uh, uh, you know, contingencies uh, that if you curtail their uh, particular export, uh, you get penalised, then a dynamic rating system could really be worth it for you. Uh, so that you can actually see, okay, right, we can actually push this line above our deterministic rating because we've got a high wind at this particular time and we don't have to curtail the IPP um, uh, uh, generation, especially if relating to wind farms. Um, if, if, if they're generating due to the wind farms and uh, the wind is then blowing, um, you might be able to increase your power transfer on that particular line out of the IPP uh, due to the fact that the wind's blowing. And their dynamic system can, in fact, be extremely useful for you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Um, there's another question by Teboko Ntombela. Does these conditions of operating differ for monopoles and lattice double circuit structures? Or it's uh, is it all the same for 132KB regardless of the structure type? I, I think I answered that question. No, it's, it's independent of oh, structure okay. type. Yeah. All right. It's so there's another by Nicholas Xavier. He'd like to know how can one access conference output and are they also Scopus research? Did you just let's repeat the question? Uh, they'd like to know how can one access conference output? I think in terms of the literature, are they also Scopus research? Oh, yes, uh, the, the literature on this is, um, oh, uh, Scopus, um, the, yeah, the the, um, the 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 Scopus registration is with the Seagrass Science Engineering, so it's a Scopus registered paper, like the IEEE. Um, so uh, academics will get credits for publishing within that paper. That's a Scopus, um, and then the uh, the Seagrass Science Engineering is free download. So if you're searching for any papers uh, within that, you can um, download them for free. Uh, also, the Electra has articles on that. Um, the articles related, as I said, to the brochures 299 and 601 um, are free download to, to, to members. And I said to, to students who don't have to pay, pay a membership fee, um, the membership fee is actually less than one brochure. So if you want to download more than one brochure, it's actually worthwhile to join Seagrade uh, because it costs you less uh, in the membership fees than downloading the particular um downloading the particular uh, uh brochure itself i hope that answers the question okay thank you i think we've got two more we could go through uh by herbert uh, luchschitz can you estimate the percentage of ohl equipped with real-time tr worldwide Uh, welcome, Herbert, who is a previous uh, study committee chair from Austria. Um, it, it's difficult to say, Herbert. Uh, the, <laughs> there was a, a large pickup um, of, of real-time systems uh, in the US uh, around about 20 years ago. That seems to have dropped, um, but they seem to be picking up a bit more now. But I, I would, it's, it's very hard to guess, but I would say it's much probably less than 10% um of of lines have have real-time systems uh on the particular lines i know that in belgium there's quite a few uh the lines going over the borders um but as a percentage of total lines within belgium is most probably quite small on the inter international between the um between countries and in market critical areas and perhaps with ipps we might find quite a bit but i would expect that we might start finding um, these applications becoming slightly more uh, uh, popular uh, going forward. 
Uh, but at the moment, it's not really great. The, the big problem that they had was integration with the, the operators um, and the, uh, the actual interface with the operators in the SCADA systems um, as to whether the operators would accept the, um, the dynamic uh, ratings coming through uh, uh, from these systems and whether they would uh, react to them um, or not. So that was really the the the, the main issue was was the uh, interface with the, with the operators. But uh, with the with the, obviously with the advent of markets and and renewables, it might be something that uh, is 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 possible to to uh, increase in in future. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Our next question is a two part question by Tando Landela or Landila. Uh, when operating from 70 to uh, from 50 to 70 degrees templating, my concern is the behavior of the conductor since it has gone through creep and expansion con slash contraction over the years. Isn't there a risk of damaging the conductor when retensioning? Also considering that you might need to add more structures due to higher sag, i.e. 70 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Normally, then, what? We, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Is there no, another sorry, question? No, sorry. You can go ahead. Answer the first part of the question, and then we'll okay. go to the second. All right. Now, look. Basically, what you've got to check. You, we we do the initial and final sags, um, and that's at the particular uh, temperatures. When you when you retention, the main concerns are, uh, of course, you've got to check the conductor for integrity. Um, the conductor must be healthy. It hasn't can't have nicks. It can't have corrosion on the core affecting the aluminium, et cetera, et cetera. So the conductor's got to be good, your joints have got to be good. Um, but the big problem is if you retention only, uh, you, you, you have an issue of, um, you have an issue of vibration. So you've got to make sure that you either add vibration dampers um, and, and make sure that your, that your conductor doesn't vibrate. Um, the, going up to, to 70 degrees, 50 to 70, we found normally that going from 50 to 80, even on a new line, you, it's not really expensive because you can actually just lift the conductor, changing your insulator configuration. Um, and then, then of course, there's no, there's no increase in tension in that. If you've got to put new towers in, that might still be an issue, um, but it's a lot, normally a lot cheaper than um, reconductoring the line itself. And normally find it's about, uh, if you're taking a line and you're temperating between 50 and 70 uh, on a new line, you're looking at around about, gee, it's, it's really about three to five percent. It's not a lot of increasing cost uh, because remember that uh, um, a lot of lines aren't uh, aren't ground scale, ground span limited. Uh, there's you'll be amazed how many uh, valleys etc. are. So a lot of the time. Your 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 actual sag is is above uh, your your actual ox, ox act. It's not a it's not a ground span limited. It's a, even on a flat ground in the Karoo, you'll find that you don't have that many uh, spans which are limited uh, uh, are, are right on the particular limit. Um, and and so therefore you to increase you only have to increase certain spans and you can do that either. Uh, with, with different methods to increase the height of, of the conductor above the ground. Okay, if, if, I hope that answers the first part. Um, yeah, so the second part is, where does the rule come from regarding templating MV lines at 50 and HV at 70 degrees? Can these be changed for higher current capacity issues? Um, MV lines are normally voltage limited. And for that reason, the temperating temperature is normally kept at 50 because you don't need much more power down the line. However, if you have a short MV line, um, or you've got voltage regulators, or you've got um, other support of your voltage um, uh, in, in the particular uh, area that you're looking at, you can definitely temperate them up higher than, than your 50 and then use the ratings um, published to actually get more power down that particular line. Um, so there's no rule that it must be done at 50 the, 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 um, that I'm aware of. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the main reason to leave it at 50 is because 
uh, 11 and 22 kV lines are mainly voltage limited. That's where you start hitting thermal ratings from 66, 88, 122 kV. That's your real area where you get a lot of thermal rating issues. Then 275, you can get a couple of them, and then 400, depending on the length of the line. But if the line lengths are, are, are um, less than 100 kilometers, you can start getting thermal rating issues. So re really, that's a reason for the MV. But there's no reason not to temperate those lines higher. In the past, I never really temperated MV lines. Uh, they weren't always surveyed, but I understand now they are always surveyed, so you can definitely uh, determine what temperating temperature and what rating you need. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rob. There's a, a last question by Adim Chenobi Asigbu. Thanks for the informative session. Uh, please may you elaborate on how we can join Seagray as a candidate PhD. I think you kind of covered that with the universities, but um, if there's any additional um, yes, items um, you'd like to share. Uh, to, to join Seagra as a student, you need to go through the national committee. So if you go to the if you go to the Seagra website, you'll see the national committee and you'll see the chairperson at the moment at Sidwell and Tetwa from Eskom. And uh, you can then um, uh, informing that you that you are a student member and you would like to join as a student member. The reason that you can, if you're not, a, if you don't want to join the student member, you can go straight to the uh, the the uh, website and click on join Seagray. It then puts it through to the national committee, and you can then um, uh, uh, pay. Uh, the reason that you need to go through the national committee um, to join as a student is that they need to verify that you are actually a student. That's the only reason. Um, and once you've done that, uh, you can then uh, you get a you get a, a student you you get a C grade uh, number membership number, and with that number you can then go on to EC grade, um, and you can register with uh, the particular number etc. And you uh, you can then download the documents. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Um... I'd like to now hand over. Oh, so there's one more coming in. What if I'm above 35 years old? Am I eligible? At 35 and over, you are. You can of course join. Um, if you're a student, it, it does it. It is no no real age. If you want to be a, an, a young member, um, uh, you can. That's an, a, a member type two where you pay less. You have to be under 35 um, and normally our next generation network membership is under 35 um, but if you're a student as far as i know there's no age limit as long as you are registered as a student uh, and you are to half of your 50 uh, percent of your time is spent in academic activity uh, you can you can register Thank you, Dr. Rob, and thank you to um, our attendees. I'd like to now hand over to Minx. Thank you, thank you very much, Crystal. Um, Dr. Stephen, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. And most importantly, also our attendees, thank you very much. As Crystal mentioned, there's two handouts in the handout section. There's uh, the SIRE Training Academy brochure for your, um, in, for your perusal as well as the June issue of the What Now magazine. I'll give you a few seconds to download if you haven't done that. Also, please look at the chat box for our links, how to become an SRIE member. Also, um, as you saw on the questions page, if you want to get involved in the KZN Centre, um, SRIE has nine centres nationwide, but you can email kznc at saie.org.za or alternatively email reception at saiee.org.za to get involved in a centre in your area. Ladies and gentlemen, this now concludes our webinar for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us and have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay,